This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually we're great, but together we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com. That's A T L A S S I A N.com. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Atlassian. The DFS Studio is brought to you by DraftKings. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast with your hosts, Kyle Borgannoni and Matthew Betts. Yo, 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 it's Friday. October 27th, we're back. It's the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I am joined, as always, by Matthew, just staring into the abyss, Bets. I need this show, Kyle. I need this show. I need the slate. I need something in my life to, to go in the right direction here uh, after what happened this week. So, yeah, this is a forward-thinking show. Yes. Um, no need to dwell on the past. Uh, it's time to look, to look forward here to Sunday slate. Yeah, I appreciate that fantasy football gives us a chance to press reset every single week. DFS especially, right? It's like we get new salaries, a brand new slate. Maybe you'll feel it in your bankroll from the week weekend before, but you at least get to like have optimism of, oh, this is what's going to happen on a showdown game, or, oh, here's how I'm going to feel in cash, or I have this feel in tournaments. So do you have a certain feeling Heading into week A, just you know, just vibes only. You know, that's all you have to share right now. But just a certain feeling heading into this week about your feel for the slate. Yeah, I think it's super interesting because no teams are on by, right? So we've got that going for us, and the slate sort of got flipped when we got the Brock Purdy news. So now everyone is going to be trying to jam in Sam Darnold and then kind of go from there, which means I think you're going to get access to a lot of high ceiling quarterbacks at pretty reasonable roster percentages, which is a lot of fun because, you know, I think and we'll talk about Darnold for cash, but like if Darnold goes out for 12, 13, 14, it's like, okay, cool. That works for cash. But like, man, if Jalen Hurts or Mahomes or Lamar puts up 35 points, you're going to need those guys in tournaments. So I love these slates where you can kind of flip that build a little bit and go from there. But uh, yeah, man, it, it's fun. I think there's a lot of moving parts on the slate too that it makes it a tricky thing to kind of diagnose right away. But as we move through throughout the weekend, we'll get a lot of information and uh, and I'm excited about it. Yeah, I, I love thinking about when we get cheap quarterbacks or any cheap player, we always talk about this is what they have to do at their salary. So depending on what tournament you play in, if it's a small field, single entry, if it's a three max, 20 max, if you're going to the Millie Maker, whatever it is, you need to actually think that out and look at some of our ceiling projections in the optimizer and say to yourself, like, what does this stack, what could the stack do? Like last week, one of the things I talked about was Mahomes and Kelsey, they need to hit 65 plus points. And if they do, they're an awesome play and they crush that. Same thing with Lamar and Andrews. That was my slate breaker this past week. I think I'm like one for six on slate breakers this year. But man, that one hit. You you need those players to hit 60 plus points. Yeah, don't worry about that, Kyle. We don't talk about we don't talk about the misses, okay? <laughs> just just the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You miss hundred percent of the shots, right? Um, exactly. So it's a great slate. I'm excited to talk about it. We will be talking about our cash picks in just a second. But once again, if you want to get the DFS pass, it is 33% off right now. If you go to dfspass.com right now, I'm looking at our optimizer. I was looking at our roster percentage projections and where we stand on Samuel Darnold. Isn't that funny? It was just like, that is not what I had on my bingo card at the beginning of the week, much less like the beginning of the season to say, hey, I'm going to be depending on my hard-earned money on a backup quarterback for the 49ers that is not named Trey Lance. What a time to be alive, Kyle. What a time to be alive. Hey, we played Aiden O'Connell a few weeks ago, so I feel like Darnold is at least it's maybe a, a little up. more talented <laughs> than that, so not the grossest play we've ever had. Yeah, I can tell you right now, Darnold will be in our cash game picks if you want to get those for DraftKings, for FanDuel. You can get them at DFSPass.com. And you can be a part of this sweet, sweet community on our Discord. Let's talk out our cash picks. Straight cash, homie. So I'm seeing two quarterbacks in our pool right now 
that you and I are considering on as of our recording. It's Jalen Hurts at 8.2, plays against Washington on the road, or it is Sammy D, Sam Darnold at 4.3 against Cincinnati. Give me the pros and cons of those two because they're obviously very different in pricing, almost $4,000 difference. Yeah, it's massive. And, and this is kind of the decision point, I think, in cash games is do you spend up for the safety of Jalen Hurts in a game environment we like? We're going to talk about that game stack. Uh, obviously, the Eagles offense we want to bet on every week. Jalen Hurts just so likely to get one or two uh, tush push attempts inside the two or one yard line. Um, I think he already has like six rushing scores on just those plays this year, which is just crazy. Um, so you're getting that. But also, the matchup is awesome. And the last time we saw these teams play, the Eagles went very pass heavy, very, very aggressive through the air. AJ Brown's playing out of control. He's unreal. Dallas Goddard is emerging. We know Devonta Smith at any point can pop up. So you got that plus the offensive line. It just, you can't really poke holes, right? And we talked on Tuesday and it was like, well, let's see what's going on with this knee issue from the Sunday night game. Uh, apparently that is fine. He was full practice this week. So Hertz looks great. But of course, like you said, you're paying for it. For Sam Darnold, he's 4,300, which means we're not expecting him to break the slate for us. If he gives you 12, 13, 14 points, somewhere in that range, you're probably going to be decently happy because what it allows you to do is spend up for Tyree Kill, Jamar Chase, AJ Brown, I mean, whoever you want. And then the running backs we'll talk about, uh, you know, there's great guys in like Alvin Kamara, Travis Etienne project very well, Tony Pollard projects well. There's so many awesome plays on the slate that my lean is to go down to Darnold to get up to those guys. Not to say that Jalen Hurts is a bad play, he's obviously a great play, but it's really a salary savings thing. And the thing that I, I really wish was going on for Sam Darnold is I wish Debo Samuel was in because that would make the decision so easy. But he's still got Ayuk, you know, he's still got CMC, uh, and he's still got Kittle. So I think my lean is Darnold. But what are you, what are your takes there? I look at it right now, and you know, I was trying to compare to other slates when we had Aiden O'Connell or you know any other weeks that you wanted to play somebody a cheap quarterback. And with those, it was like okay, their offense stinks, but there also wasn't a pay up option that you felt scared of. And I do feel scared of Jalen Hurts, to be honest. But at least with Sam Darnold, we have an offense we can trust in a game environment that could just be a dud. But like the total didn't drop dramatically, right? Like I think it was just a point and a half uh, from what it was. So it's it's like we would say Sam Darnold's obviously a downgrade, but for his price and for what the 49ers you know, are still favored at home, I think there's just a lot to like. So if it'd be different if he was 5K. I think you and I would just be saying, okay, but 4.3 and a $4,000 difference between the player that we like the most in the spend-up options feels massive. So play around with combinations. Like, don't just lock in Darnold and just say, oh, that's what everyone's going to do. Like, I really am playing around, but in my early iterations of my cash lineup, it's like, well, you know, if I want to fit in Tyreek or if I want to fit in, you know, any of these other spend-up options, a wide receiver or running back, Sam Darnold's kind of the route. So I think Darnold's probably going to be where the field does anyways. And at quarterback, it's like, oh, sweet. I I, I can figure out, I don't want to make a mistake there. So I, I think Sam Darnold's fine. We'll talk about that in tournaments. On FanDuel, I think Lamar is actually in play as well. If you want to look at Lamar at 8.8, that is totally fine. He's going to crush against the Ravens. By the way, as we started recording this podcast, I just traded for Lamar Jackson in my main home league. Oh, you went through with that uh, that 2v2 deal? Yeah, it was uh, it was Lamar Jackson and Dalton Kincaid for Justin Herbert and Dallas Goddard. It's, I mean, that's a super fair trade, in my opinion. I, okay. I love the upside of Lamar the rest of the season. I mean, come on, you know we love we love Lamar. Um, but I know you gave up the Herbert and Keenan stack, so I, that's risky, so man. My heart, the heart wants what the heart wants, and the fact that Lamar was my my guy this year made it a little easier. But that Chargers stack is so sweet. It also Man, that that messes with my heart. It has messed with me for years. <laughs> so I decided to move on and go for a player in four point leagues that I think Lamar is a difference maker because he runs. So fun fact. Um, I love running back this week. I think this is a week where you could legitimately have three running backs in your build and it makes a ton of sense. So for me, the top three are Kamara at 7.3, uh, ETN at 7.2, and Brees Hall at 5.9. Those are going to show up incredible in our projections. And I I mean, I have builds where I've done it so far. It's like, I want all three in there. 
but two of those three will probably end up in my cash lineup unless we get some other value play. Yeah, it's it's a really good slate for running backs for sure. You know, in the DFS pass in my cash article, I usually just try to list like my top four, but truthfully, there's probably five or six that I feel very strong about uh, on this slate. I think my favorite when you consider price, and I'm sure you would agree, is Brees Hall. We talked about that a little bit on Tuesday. It's just like, man, they are completely phasing out Dalvin Cook. His snaps have gone down three weeks in a row before the bye week. Then we had a rumbling uh, rumor that they were trying to see what he, they could get for him in the trade market. And at the same time, in those three games where his snaps went down, Brees Halls have trended in the right direction. Another week healthier off the ACL. Gets a Giants defense giving up uh, five yards per carry to running backs. It's such a good spot. And I don't know if you saw any of the line movement. Not that it matters a ton because this game is so low scoring, but it was, I think, open minus two and a half for the Jets. It is now minus three for the Jets. Like It's moving in the right direction that you could see a Brees Hall positive game script. So for me, he is locked, and then I'm trying to figure it out from there. Yeah, I, so Brees feels super safe. It's impossible for me to not look at Kamara as also a wide receiver. Um, I also love Tony Pollard this week. He's a better play on FanDuel. So in my cash lineup on FanDuel, Tony Pollard at 7.6 is a steal for his role. They're six-point favorites at home. So I love Tony Pollard there. I wish he was a little cheaper uh, coming off the bye, and we haven't really seen him go off. Like, I wish if he was 7K or, like, 6.8 or 6.9, like, I feel like it'd be more palatable. But um, any other thoughts at running back? Yeah, I like those names that you mentioned. Um, I think Pacheco is still in play. You know, this is kind of the, the matchup we've been talking about all year against the Broncos. Same price as last week. He, they didn't really move him. Uh, he was good. You know, over the last couple of weeks, he's been good. He hasn't really had this kind of, you know, 23, 24 point performance. It's kind of been in the 15 to 16 ish range. Um, that's, I think, fine on this slate. I don't know that he has as high of a ceiling, you know, as someone like Brees, obviously ETN, those guys. But I think Pacheco is fine. I also saw McKinnon popped up with something uh, on Wednesday on the injury report or, or Thursday, maybe it was. So monitor that with what's going on. But Pacheco's role has just been so good, man. Averaging 19.4 total opportunities per game over his last five games, including over three targets a game. So like you're getting, you know, a true three down role, so to speak, for Pacheco. Chiefs obviously projected to win this game and also score one of the highest team implied totals on the slate. So uh, I think Pacheco at 6.1 is also rock solid. So there's a lot of running backs in our projections right now that, in cash would be fine in tournaments. They would be fine. So more from like a philosophical or just structure standpoint, we said three running backs in cash is totally fine. Do you think the field will be overconfident in that in tournaments where you and I usually say like, Hey, we're playing a wide receiver in the flex and you get access to ceiling. And it seems like on this slate, you're probably going to get lower roster percentage of a wide receiver in the flex. Yeah, probably. I think that's probably true, especially because if you think about like Darnold cheap, then you go up at running back to these kind of five and six K or, or really five and seven K running backs. Then it kind of leaves this, this like, you know, upper four K range to like six K range at wide receiver where there's a few standout plays that we'll talk about, but there's a lot of, I think really good wide receiver plays there too, that I don't think are necessarily cash viable, but I definitely want to chase their ceilings in tournaments. So I think the field will probably go, like you said, a little bit more with that three running back build. Not that that's wrong or right either way. Just if you want to get different, I think the wide receiver and the flex this week is, is definitely interesting. The, I'm not really messing around in the 4K region at running back because there's so many other solid plays. Like I see, you know, some chatter about, oh, can we play Daryl Henderson again on the road against Dallas 4.8? It's just not my favorite spot. Same thing with Kareem Hunt. In a redraft league, sure, he's fine. But at 5.2, he doesn't feel like he has access to the same ceiling as some of these other guys against a tough Seattle rush defense. Amari DiMarcato also playing against a tough defense against Baltimore. So all three of those guys will show up as, oh, they're cheap. Can I play them? I won't be playing them in cash personally. Uh, so that's kind of the route. But last question I have about running backs, because it's this is a running back slate. What are we doing with Christian McCaffrey? Knowing that Darnold is in play, I feel fine playing those two together in cash. He's just expensive at 9.2. So do you have a lean on CMC? I think my my take right now is that I probably won't play him in cash. I just prefer to get up to, assuming we get the full you know bill of health throughout the week of Tyreek Hill, who is back at practice on Thursday, assuming he's good to go and healthy, 
I prefer Tyreek Hill over Christian McCaffrey for $300 more. You can get to it on the slate pretty easily, I think. So that's my take for cash games. But I mean, if he's going to come in around 10, 12, 13%, something like that in tournaments, I mean, CMC ceiling, obviously, is something we want to chase every week. So again, we talk about how you get different with kind of your builds. Everyone is going to be playing, I think, Brees and then like one of ETN, uh, maybe Kamara, like kind of in that range. So if you want to get different, spending up for CMC in tournaments, I think is definitely a way to do that. We'll talk about the pace of play moving wide receiver, the pace of play of the Miami game, because there are routes where that game fails. And it's it's weird to say that it has the highest total on the slate when it's just at like, what, 46, 46 and a half. So it's not great, but Tyreek is going to show up everywhere as a great play. And I, I just can't poke holes. He did not like ball out against them in week two. It was just five for 40 and a touchdown, which... Man, if you you would take that every single week if you got five for forty and touchdown in like a home league. But in DFS, you're paying ninety five hundred. That's expensive. Now on FanDuel, the fact that he's the same price makes him a crazy value. So on FanDuel, he's pretty much a lock for me in cash. Uh, I think on DraftKings, I'm still figuring out what else I can fit in. So give me the lay of land at wide receiver. Yeah, it's a. I think it's an interesting slate when you think about kind of the next tier of guys that you would call cash viable. Because you drop down from Tyreek and then you look at like the Jamar Chase range at like 8.1. Um, AJ Brown, you asked me on Tuesday, is he cash viable? And I said, I think so, right? Like, I mean, he's just been so dominant. Um, 125 plus yards in five straight games. He's going for, I think it's an NFL record six in a row this week. This is the matchup where he just went bonkers last week. And we talked about how good the matchup is for Jalen Hurts. So I think it's it's a decision point. You can probably play uh, one or both of those guys with uh, your cash lineup if you want to. My lean, I think, is Jamar Chase. And it's not that I don't want to play A.J. Brown. It's just that Jamar Chase quietly, like no one's really talking about this, is leading the NFL in targets per game. And you get the Bengals coming out of the bye week. Uh, Joe Burrow is healthier. You know, they were already trending in a super positive direction with their pass rate over expectation before the bye week. They're all the way up to second on the year in that metric. And teams against San Francisco are throwing at the second highest rate this year. So everything on paper says this is not a Joe Mixon spot. I think Burrow is going to be chucking. And Kirk Cousins just carved him up, right? Like San Francisco has given up big wide receiver games this year. So I think that's my lean of those two. And then from there, you just drop down to the 5K range. And there's some pretty fun from plays down there. That feels like a soundbite that you and I could have had from week three, week four, week five. Like, hey, we're playing Jamar Chase. And I'm with you. I Still think the price is egregious for what he can do. I think Higgins will come back also into play. So it, that's a fun game because there's the Darnold piece, there's CMC. What are the routes? I mean, Mixon is still showing up in projections that people want to play him. And he's knocking on the door fantasy opportunity, like in terms of expected points, like we're waiting for the explosion. Last year it didn't happen until week 10, and he had a five touchdown game. So it can happen. One of the big things on this slate is I think I want a Jacksonville pass catcher in my cash lineup. Like I think that's like the rule. So Christian Kirk is 5.8, or I mean 5.9. Calvin Ridley, who is terrifying to play in cash, but I think he's a fun leverage play in tournaments is 5.8. And Evan Ingram is four and a half. So is it kind of just like, hey, play Kirk. He's been awesome. He's been consistent and still not above 6K. Yeah, this is the first week that Kirk is priced above Calvin Ridley, finally. But you just look at his game logs, like going all the way back to week two, everyone freaked out. If you you drafted him in season long or whatever, best ball, you were so worried about Christian Kirk, right? In week one, since then, he is the wide receiver 11 in PPR leagues. And just for reference on this slate, he's priced as the wide receiver 17. That includes a slate without Keenan Allen, Stephon Diggs, Amon Ross St. Brown, et cetera, et cetera. So He's underpriced relative to how good he's been. And Pittsburgh has given up the second most wide receiver yards in the NFL. And uh, they are top five in PPR slot wide receiver points given up. We were all on Kirk last week, you know, on the showdown slate and in props. Uh, we might be talking about him later. Just a spoiler alert there for you. Nice. But he's been so good, man. I don't know how you don't play him again at this price tag with the news that Zay Jones is missing practice again this week. So for me, if I'm picking one, it's Christian Kirk. Yeah, I like that game. We're not going to talk about it, but Jacksonville. Pittsburgh, there's a lot of good correlative plays where you're like, okay, you can play Kirk and George Pickens, who just, you know, let's ignore George Pickens 
you know, a lot longer if we want to. He's on pace for over 1,400 receiving yards. That's why you put that out <laughs> on Twitter the other day. I was like, wait, what? Is that real? And then well, I looked, funny. sure enough. I looked it up. It shocked me. I tweeted it out. I looked it up again just to make sure that like, okay, maybe there was something off and I, and I got this wrong and somebody's going to correct me. It was right. And here's what's wild. I looked it up a third time because I was like, I know that I'm the person that tweeted this out. I do not believe this, but it's true. And he's already had a buy. <laughs> so it's like, he's, he's, yeah, he's playing out of his mind. He's not that expensive. So, you know, there's a couple different plays. Deontay is somebody you can play in cash too at 5k. I, you're getting the targets, uh, you know, one week back and he was totally fine. So any of those guys are good. Zay Flowers at 5.6. We like Josh Downs. He has a 23% target share in Gardner Minshew games. He's totally fine at 4.8. I feel like I'm starting to wane a little bit on him. Like we're going to have a Gardner game that isn't just volume and it's just him imploding. And so far it's been two high volume games. And then this past week in Cleveland where he only completed like 15 passes, but uh, that game went off and it felt like it lasted six quarters. So I, I think Josh Downs is fine, but I probably won't end up with him. Is that okay? Uh, Yeah, I don't think you need him for cash games. I think if he makes your build work, he's fine. I kind of like him for tournaments more personally. Um, He is cheap, like you said, and this is kind of the matchup that you play against the Saints. It's these slot wide receivers where Josh Downs will operate primarily. Alec Pierce is doing nothing. They don't really involve the tight ends to a high degree. And Michael Pittman probably is going to see a lot of Marshawn Lattimore this week, right? So like, I think if you're playing one that projects best for those reasons, it is Josh Downs. So I think I'm more interested than you, uh, primarily in tournaments. But uh, I do think this is still a sneaky good spot for him. He's been great. And, you know, Gardner, like you said, hasn't been the best from an efficiency standpoint. But they are just getting off so many plays. Their pace is awesome. So I'm still in on Josh Downs this week. Jordan Addison is somebody I have to mention, 5.7. Not just what he did on Monday night, but his role is so strong. So he's somebody that you can end up in your cash pool, see if it works. I think Kirk's a little bit easier to project from a target share. Same thing with Zay Flowers. I was going to say, before we move on, we we kind of brushed over Zay Flowers. I think he's an awesome play. Okay. Yeah. I I just wanted to make sure that he got thrown in there. I do want to bring up the question because you and I did not mention anybody super cheap this week and I'm not finding a punt play that I feel super comfortable with so is that like an automatic because I feel like builds every single week it's like oh it was Wandale you know it was you know whoever JSN there's always cheap guys that we just start our lineups with and they end up being locked in from like Tuesday Wednesday Thursday on I'm not finding a guy that I love this week I'm with you and I don't think you really have to go there on this slate uh, I mean, if you play Jalen Hurts, you might have to, but if you play Sam Darnold, you don't have to, which is kind of why I'm leaning that way is because you can get uh, a couple of the studs, you can get Tyreek, you can great great running backs, and you can still fit a couple of these 5K guys and really make everything work. So that's why I'm leaning the Darnold uh, construction for cash because like you said, I don't see a lot here in the low you know, four or upper 3K range at wide receiver that I truly like for cash games. I'll throw out a name just to be gross and you don't have to like it, but I just want to give a cheap name. Rondale Moore is 3.4 and what he's seeing an, I know he's seeing enough targets and rush attempts last three weeks, three, three and four rush attempts. So it's something I just wanted to give a cheap name. So let's, let's move on tight end. We have the expensive guys and we talked about that last week a lot. Like the, the strategy is you have to figure out what to do with Kelsey or Andrews. The cheap guys this week are Evan Ingram, Turd Ferguson at 3.6, a.k.a. Jake Ferguson, and then Trey McBride at 2.8. Is that where you're leaning? Yeah, I think right now McBride's probably the preferred play. Um, Nothing stands out on paper as far as the matchup goes. Baltimore has been great, uh, period, but also great against tight ends. But he's 2.8. He's underpriced given that Zach Ertz is now on IR with a quad injury. And even before the Zach Ertz news came, uh, in weeks one through five, McBride was only playing 39% of the snaps. Over the last two weeks, it's been trending in the right direction up to 56% of the snaps, and he's seen 11 targets over the last two weeks. That was with Zach Ertz in. So I think we're going to see his route rate probably up in the 80 plus percent range, which is what we look for at tight end. And he's probably a good bet for six, seven targets, somewhere in that range, right? And, and that at 2.8 is always going to be uh, appealing, even if the matchup isn't good. 
Yeah, I do want to give some love to Darren Waller on FanDuel. I think his price is totally fine. He has a 30% target share over the last three weeks. So you're, you're getting a wide receiver one at a cheap price, and I think he works well in FanDuel. So just want to throw out his name. At defense this week, everybody will be playing the Falcons. Who knew the Falcons would be so popular in a game that has the lowest total of the entire year, 35 and a half right now. They're 2.9. They're playing against the Will Willises as I've been calling them in my head, Will Levis, Malik Willis, the Will Willises. And you're just going to play them in cash, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think I think you are. Um, it's, it's the quarterback thing, right? But then also, like, I mentioned this a little bit. We talked on Tuesday. Like, the Falcons have been good on defense. 12th in EPA per play. They're fourth in pressure rate, which is not something we've been able to say for five years in a row. Uh, and they're fourth in yards per play allowed. So they've been good. And they're going to get some combo of Malik Willis and Will Levis. So I think you just play them. Yeah, there's other routes. If you want to go to Seattle, they're fine. But I think everybody's going to go towards Atlanta. You eat the chalk and cash. But I want to be very strong about this point. There are so many great leverage points at defense this week around this price. Like in tournaments, do not feel like you have to play the Falcons. Yes, they have some upside. They can end up with eight points. And in cash, you love it. But in tournaments... You might look at this game and go, wow, that was a 17 to 10 game and that game stunk and it didn't actually help me for a ceiling outcome. I mean, there's the Packers at home are $200 less and they have some awesome splits against Kirk Cousins when he plays in Lambeau. Like Kirk Cousins, this last uh, last three games in Lambeau, five interceptions and he's throwing for like 170 yards a game. So there's some upside there. Um, You know, there's some other cheap teams this week. Jaguars, we talked about on Tuesday. They're a great team. Uh, the Browns have a good defense. And then I just want to say, you could flip the build and play the Titans at home against Desmond Ritter and get a couple of crazy turnovers. That wouldn't be crazy at all. So uh, just get different at defense, people. Don't don't just follow the crowd in, in tournaments. But it's cool that the Falcons are cool for a hot second. Actually, you know what? The Falcons are cool. Everybody hates I was going to say, no right one now. likes the Falcons right now <laughs> after what happened last week with Bijan. Yeah, I... I Everyone's pretty mad at Arthur Smith, and you probably have this conviction. I know today Mike and Andy had this, like, I think he actually, like, 5% of his decision-making is, I want to stick it to fantasy football. That's, like, part of his decisions, and I respect that. I like a Did man that just... Did price this week, by the way? 6000 Yeah, that's cheaper than Pacheco, which is crazy. Yeah, it's it's gross. Let's take a quick break, and we'll talk about these games. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually we're great, but together we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com. That's A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Atlassian. This Halloween, mystery lurks around every corner. Bundle up with Disney Plus and Hulu. What are you scared of? The dark. It's spine-tingling fun on Disney Plus with Haunted Mansion and Goosebumps. I'm going to need you to spread the word. Then feel the bone-chilling terror on Hulu with the Boogeyman and American Horror Story Delicate. Something's happening to me. The Disney Bundle with Hulu and Disney Plus. All of these and more streaming this month. Plans starting at $9.99 a month. 18 plus only. Access content from each service separately. Offer valid for eligible subscribers only. Terms apply. All right, Bets, I did that thing where I hit the ad drop, but I haven't hit the segment drop. So now I will hit the segment drop. Stack attack. First game, Kansas City Chiefs at the Denver Broncos. The Chiefs are seven-point road favorites, and this game has an over-under of 46. We like it because, well, we like the Chiefs, and they're good at football, and they're efficient, and it matters. They control the clock a ton. So that's that's one of the things that when I look at pace of play, and, and I gave this a four in our four out of five game score, which is the highest of the week. And it's a lot to do with Patrick Mahomes. This team converts third downs at the highest rate in football. Their third down rate bets is almost 50%, which is just wild. You're, you're counting 
hey, this team's going to keep a drive alive. They're going to keep it going. And then they throw inside the red zone. So it's a team that we really like for obvious reasons. But their defense is kind of too good. That's the problem with this team. And when these two teams played a couple weeks ago, it was a dud, right? It was that uh, Thursday night game, and it ended up with like 27 combined points. So do you have fears that the Broncos cannot keep pace? Yeah, uh, of course. And and this is maybe it's recency bias for me where, you know, I played some Russ last week and it was terrible. Yeah, it was just terrible. But this is a a home game, I guess you could tell yourself a story where they should be pushed to throw. So we've seen those games from Denver where it's like, man, the actual product on the field has not been great. But like third, fourth quarter come around, you're like, okay, like Russ has 250 and two. And so like one of his guys might get there sort of thing. That's the only reason I really want to bring this game up honestly uh because from an an on-field standpoint it like you said it's not a good matchup casey has been very good and you wrote about this in pace of play right like we're so used to casey having their foot you know on the gas pedal all game but they've shown a willingness this year to when they get up use pacheco a lot more and kind of play a little bit slower so i do think there is potential that this game hits the under i think there's a potential that the the chiefs get there but no one really matters on the Denver side sort of things. Um, if you're talking small field, you could see, you know, from Cortland Sutton or something like a, a five for 50 on a touchdown game, like that might be okay. But as far as like these large field lottos, I personally don't see a huge ceiling from the Denver side of this one. Yeah. I almost feel like Denver doesn't really matter on this slate because we have so many other teams. So when I look at a team and ask myself, like, can they hit their team applied total of 19 and a half? I don't know if I care. Because Kansas City games, for the year, like they're combining for just 40 a game. Like 40 is not going to get it done on this slate where you know there's going to be a couple of games in the 44 to 45 range that hit the over. We've only had one KC game this year that has hit over 50, and that was because they put up 41 against the Bears when, uh, when we started doing this Taylor Swift thing. So I really, I really think that it's just going to come down to me saying, if I'm going to play the Chiefs, Mahomes, Kelsey, one more piece, and then just get out of here. Like, other than Cortland Sutton, I'm not really interested in anybody else. Javante Williams is still too fun and too cheap, but Kansas City's defense is really good against the run. Jerry Judy doesn't even exist in the NFL anymore. Um, So, yeah, I think that's how I would do it. I would just go Mahomes, Kelsey, and then I guess Rasheed Rice and get out of here. Yeah, I think Rasheed Rice is, is the dude. You know, we've been kind of talking about this for a couple of weeks. We talked about him a lot on the Dynasty show this week. The route rate is is great. It's 23% up to 50% up to 65%. That's great for Kansas City. Like there are wide receivers on this slate, obviously running 85, 90% of the routes. So like you just need that number to keep going in the right direction and sort of hope it does. Because eventually if this, if if what he's been doing at those levels continue, like he will be 5,500, 6K in a couple of weeks if this trend keeps happening. So you can tell yourself like, hey, I know right now he looks overpriced, but there's a chance in three weeks you look back and we're like, man, can you remember the days when you were playing Rasheed Rice at 5K? So like he's the only guy I'm really interested in here as like a sneaky tournament play because like you said, it's obviously Mahomes and Kelsey and I think you can throw him on there if you want. Like you said though, my concern is just the game fails and so he's a better I think I mentioned this last week. He's a better small field play to me, Rishi Rice is, than large field lottos. Can I give you something that's even sneakier? I mean, I'm I'm talking like you're going to hate me for this. Oh, you kind of snuck up on me there. I am very, very sneaky, sir. Marco Zadis Cantling. No, no, no. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> that was so last week. That was so last week. Glad we were on that. Um, I want to throw out Jarek McKinnon. And I know you hate it. He's 4,600. Okay. What if I told you? <laughs> which means I have a stat that I'm going to throw out that might not mean anything. But but it when I say what nothing. if I told you? <laughs> yeah, when I when you say what if I told you, you're using the same voice from like the 30 for 30 documentaries. And then people are like, oh, this is going to be a compelling story. Um, what if he leads all running backs in third down snaps? And what if this is the team that converts third downs at the highest rate in the NFL? And what if he hasn't had a touchdown yet in the red zone yet. And last year he had nine receiving touchdowns, including two weeks against these Broncos where he had four receiving touchdowns. He was the RB one and RB six on the slate thoughts. 
What if I told you he's not practicing Thursday because of a groin injury? Dang it! Gordonindex.com, by the way. Dang it. Well, um, I hope you really enjoyed that <laughs> spiel, and I'm glad that Betts is up to date on injury things. So, but it was a I should have I should have been nice and just like let you know as you were starting so you didn't <laughs> have to just sit here and say all that and then be like, you know, by the way, he might not play. Um, so, hey, if he's in, sure. Why not? He's a he's a fun wipeout pick, and by wipeout, what I mean is, if he gets a touchdown on the ground and this game hits the under, he pays off at his price, and I'm not playing anybody else. And I'm just moving on. I'm not worried about them on the road. So I would take Kansas City and the points, but I I, I would also take the under in this game. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm going to take Kansas City. Uh, I also think the under is in play. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, next game is Philadelphia at Washington. The Eagles are six and a half point road favorites and the over under is 45 and a half, but let's wind the clock back to week four. And this was a very competitive game in Philadelphia where the Eagles were super fortunate to walk away with a win 34 31 in overtime. The passing games look great in this one. Washington has been terrible defending the pass. And on the other end, it's like, that's all that Washington can do. They're third in pass rate over expectation, and you can't run the ball against Philadelphia, right? It's just, don't try to do it. It's not going to work. Is there any scenario here where you are looking to do anything other than stacking Hurts with somebody, just a skinny stack, hoping he gets a rushing score, and then figuring out somebody on the Washington side to bring it back with? That's like That's the logical way to approach this game. For sure. Uh, I think DeAndre Swift is in play for tournaments at his price point. Um, he's quietly 12th among all running backs in red zone touches. Of course, if they get in a two-yard line or the one-yard line, it's Jalen Hurts. It's not DeAndre Swift, so he loses value there. But he's been involved as a pass catcher. Obviously, he's getting the lion's share of the opportunities for the running backs. Um, Washington has definitely shifted to be a better run defense recently. They're 12th in yards after contact per attempt allowed and explosive rush rate but they keep just getting beat up through the air, right? So I think that's probably the preferred way to do it, like you said, is with with Hurts, and then you're stacking him. Um, do you just go with A.J. Brown because he's been so dominant? Do you double stack? What are your thoughts there? I don't love double stacking Hurts because I don't think this Washington offense is enough to say this is going to be a barn burner. Yes, it was like that in week four, but I pause. Like The problem with Washington is they throw a ton. They don't really convert a ton of first downs. So it's like, cool, you have a high pass rate over expectation. All right, well, drive stall out, and I don't really believe in the running game that much. So at the end of the day, it's like, I just don't believe Washington is good enough to push Philadelphia. And I, mean, I they almost just, beat them last game. I know. I don't think they are moving forward. I don't think that that's going to be the case this, this time. Well, that makes me happy. Yeah, I, I think you just play Hurts with you know Goddard or Hurts with A.J. Brown. And then you figure out if it's Terry on the other side. Yeah, I like Terry a lot this week, actually. He's been um, kind of held in check recently. Like, he hasn't really popped off for a huge game. But like you said, the pass rate's there. The last time these guys played, he went 886, uh, no touchdown, on 10 targets. If he gets anything close to that and falls in the end zone, I mean, that's a slate-winning performance at 5,300. He's super cheap. And if you look at his usage, you know, over the, the first three games, he was way down there in air yard share and first read target share, but those things are all jumping up week over week over week. So like he is emerging as the dude for this offense and we're getting a really nice price discount. So when you factor in that, you know, say flowers is, is kind of around this price, Christian Kirk's a little bit more expensive. Um, you know, Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, they're all right there. I think Terry is a super sneaky play this week at his price. You've always been a Terry dude. It's just, it's in your DNA. Um, is Devonta Smith a good pivot in this game over A.J. Brown? Because I, I don't think you're playing those two together. There's no Jalen Hurts double stack situation with those two. Last year, I mean, there, there was times where it paid off, but like now A.J. Brown is up at 8K, right? So that's the tricky conversation. I mean, at some point, dude, we know Devonta Smith is going to have a huge game. At this point, I can't tell you when it's going to be. A.J. Brown is just in another level of play right now. Like he's been one of the best wide receivers in the NFL period. So it really is a, a one and two situation, not one, a one B. So of course, can he pop off? Sure. You're going to get very low roster percentage. 
I just, I, I don't have much confidence right now. What if I told you it will be this game and we might be talking about that player later? You can guarantee it? Uh, yeah, we've got a sponsor for it. That's how guaranteed oh, it is. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, all right. I, I got in. a really good sponsor for this week. Well, don't tell me now. We'll I'm, I'm not. I, I won't. But uh, great, it's coming up. So any other thoughts, you can give me your biggest pick. Uh, yeah, I just want to mention too, Dallas Goddard's been great recently. If you want a price point pivot that we like to talk about, Evan Ingram, 4,500, going to be very chalky. 100 bucks more Dallas Goddard in a game environment we like. Um, over the last three weeks, Washington has allowed the second most schedule adjusted fantasy points to tight ends. And Goddard's been great. So we like all these guys, <laughs> which means one of them certainly isn't going to get there. But I think he should be in your player pool if you're making multiple tournament lineups. That makes me sad because I just traded him away. But I, I agree with you. So Philly on the road, six and a half. It, it's hard for me to, to trust Sam Howell and think that he can just get away with bad decision making. So I, I, I will take Philadelphia in the points. That feels right. But at the same time, I mean, Washington has just kind of had their number as far as keeping games close. They beat them last year in prime time. They almost beat them couple weeks ago so i'm gonna take the points with washington i think this game stays close Jeez, you don't even care about your team anymore next game well, that's just my way of hedging you know I, oh. I take the points with washington and they smash them and it's like oh all good that's true next game is new england at miami miami is a nine point favorite over under is 45 this game has been bet down and was at 47 and i have some worries that this is a game that just duds because usually you'd say, all right, it's Miami. They're going to press on the gas. Everybody else is just along for the ride. The problem is, is that New England kind of showed you last week, like they can keep things close. And if they get ahead early, it slows things down. Miami also plays way slower than people realize. Like they're one of the slowest teams in the league, 29th in seconds per play. But you don't need a ton of seconds when you can get long bombs. So it's more of a game of efficiency and what they could do, and you saw earlier on in the, in the year that this game was close. It was just a touchdown. So I wonder if you're going to this game saying, I'm just going to play Tua, play Tyreek, if you're going to be able to get the ceiling that some of these other games, I think, offer. Like, you know, I, I just think Hurts and A.J. Brown feel like they're in a better matchup in a game that can be pushed way more than what version of Mac Jones we're going to get. Now, last week, Mac Jones was awesome. 83% completion rate. He was really, really good. But I worry about that on the road. So what are your thoughts on this game and how people are going to approach it? Yeah, I mean, I think assuming Tyree Kill is healthy, he's going to be one of the most popular wide receiver plays on the slate. So just be mindful of that. Doesn't mean he's bad play. It's just kind of the, the reality and you'll have to get different elsewhere in your lineup. I still think he's great. But we did see, you know, like you mentioned kind of at the top of the show talking about cash picks, we did see Bill Belichick scheme to take him away, relatively speaking. You're never going to fully erase him from the game. But you said, what, it was like five for 50 or so in a touchdown. If he gives you that in a tournament, that's not good enough, right? So I think it's one of those interesting spots where you could talk me into being underweight in tournaments, despite him being a super great cash pick, if that makes sense. So that's kind of what I'm thinking as far as this game goes. Um I just want to point out that when they played a few weeks ago, Mac Jones was dropping back and attempting so many passes. So I think there could be value in one of his guys as a, as a dart throw. I just don't want to stack him, right? Like you can maybe play Kendrick Bourne. He's been pretty good recently. But outside of that, I'm not too interested in the New England side. Yeah, I, Ramondre is kind of interesting at his price tag at 5.4. We mentioned how good of a slate this is. So it's not like he's a must play where like, if you're playing this game and you're stacking it, then yes, Ramondre makes sense. But I'm not going to play Ramondre as a one-off play by any means. Um, I just don't know if the ceiling's there. He has seen six targets each of the last two weeks. So for me in this game, Juju is back this week, but I think it's either Ramondre or Kendrick Bourne would be the runback options. And then, I, I mean, Waddle's still just too expensive. Um, I don't love that. Mostert's really expensive, but he did go off for 121 and two last time they played. So any interest in Mostert this week? I don't think so, personally. I mean, of course, he could break the slate because they're so explosive. Uh, but it's just a tough price point to get to. 
when, like you said, we've got guys that are a little bit cheaper that project just as good, if not better, in Kamara, ETN, you know, those sort of play, sort of plays. Yeah, I think Mostert's not going to be played though, which is great. So that's true. If you want leverage, if you just want to play Mostert and Bourne, and that's all you want in this game, that's fine. If you just want to play Mostert and get out, I, that makes a ton of sense. So, um, give me your Vegas take. I am going to, with super high levels of confidence, I'm going to take the Patriots to cover the spread. I will too. I will take the Patriots. And yeah, I mean, it was bet down from 47. So it seems like a game that's not trending in the right direction. So Patriots and nine. Let's talk about any other correlation or stacks we want to mention before we get to our slate breakers. So usually Bets and I will talk about three or four games the game environments aren't great this week. So instead, we'll say, hey, here is a play that you could think about that's in a favorable spot if you want to look at it this way. So for instance, I like New Orleans and Indianapolis. I don't love the quarterbacks. So if you don't want to play Derek Carr and Gardner Minshew, but you look at that game and you go, wow, well, Kamara is going to be chalky and he could be the RB1 on the slate. Like you can do that in that direction. I personally like playing Kamara and Pity City because I feel like people won't want to pay up from, uh, to that price tag at 6500 He's also kind of got the squeaky wheel narrative where he came out and said, I need more targets. So that's a combination I like in a game environment. That's pretty great. Like Colts games have been super fun this year. Their defense is allowing 27 points per game. Five of their seven games have hit the, hit the over. So that's one correlation I am into this week. Makes sense. What are your thoughts on Rams and Dallas? because it is is one of the highest totals on the slate. Dallas is six-point home favorites. I think Tony Pollard is an awesome play, but he's chalk. I haven't heard anyone talk about Cooper Cup, and last week he was the talk of the town. So if everyone is playing Tyree Kill and no one's going to play Cooper Cup after having, what, two for 20 or whatever it was, I'm pretty interested in Cooper Cup. And look, if you want to correlate him with CeeDee Lamb, who again is going to come around 6-7%, that little mini right there sounds super fun. You are talking dirty to me when you start off that sentence saying, if no one else is going to do this, then I'm in. I'm totally in. What could go wrong? No, I, I, I'm I, okay with Puka and, or Puka. I'm okay with Cooper Cup in cash. I think it's actually totally viable. I get that people won't want to do it. But in tournaments, I'm totally for it. So Pollard and Cup is expensive. And rightfully so. The, the problem with this game, why it didn't show up as much, is that Dallas is playing so slow this year dead last in neutral situation pace so it's like <clears throat> Stafford also hasn't come through as a fantasy quarterback either it's just kind of been you pick the right cup or puka week and you just kind of flow through them so in that sense if you pick the right one between them and you believe that Pollard is good chalk and you ignore it then I think you have a leg up on the field because people aren't going to be playing cup so I'm totally cool with that I just don't want to game stack this game yeah, that makes sense to me. We were going to talk about as well Cincy and San Francisco, and then the total started dropping and the lines are changing and all that sort of stuff with the Sam Darnold and Brock Purdy news. So obviously we talked about Darnold and Cash. I think you could still stack him, but the issue with that is that I think whenever you have a quote-unquote Cash quarterback, his stacking partners automatically come up in roster percentage because when people run the optimizer or whatever they do, like they know that that guy projects well, so they'll be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll stick him with you know Kittle or Ayuk or, or whoever. I kind of like stacking the Cincy side in this one as a way to just flip it, stack up Joe Burrow. You could even double stack with T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. T. Higgins is cheap, man. He's all the way down, I think, at 5,900, and he should be healthier off the rib issue. I know this passing game has burnt a lot of people, but that's going to keep, I think, the roster percentage in check. And look, man, Jordan Addison just carved him up. They've given up huge games this year to wide receivers. That's how you move the ball against San Francisco. So I'm interested in Joe Burrow stacks. The problem, the only problem I have with that is you're going Burrow, Chase, let's say CMC. Like right there, just doing the math off the top of my head, that's seven, that's $23,000 plus that you're spending. And you're going to have to have a different roster construction because there's no cheap wide receivers this week. I think it's going to be hard. So I love it because no one else is playing it. And everyone's playing, you know, Darnold and Cash. So I, I like that from a tournament perspective. I just wonder if I'm going to be so short based on Chase and CMC being two of the most expensive players on the slate, 
where some of these other games give you value options, but I just mentioned, you know, Cooper Cup and Pollard, and they're expensive too. So the pivot options this week are not as like, sweet, I'm going to play these guys, they're cheap, and I can still play the other chalk guys. Like, no, they're they're expensive pivot options. So that makes it a little different. But I, I, I agree. I think that game is totally fine to stack from that side. All right. It's time for our slate breakers. And we got a really, really good sponsor this week. It's it's one that goes back to my childhood, maybe yours, Bets. And it's Mario Tennis from N64. Were you a fan? I spent so much time playing that game. What a what a throwback, Kyle. It's it was well, the best part about that is a lot of people, if you didn't play tennis, who cares about a video game about tennis? I could care less about a game where I'm playing as like Pete Sampras or somebody else, but I'm getting to play as Mario or I'm getting to play as Waluigi, which was the first game ever that Waluigi was on. Like, that's pretty great. And I bring that up because for Halloween this year, I will be Waluigi and my kids are going to be Mario and uh, Luigi. Love that. Very on brand for you. I know. I'm feeling pretty good about it. You, do you have your Halloween stuff? Or do you guys go like so, at, with the kids, like at, all dressed up same theme? So th- we were just talking about this, actually, because this is our first year where we're in a neighborhood where we actually will have trick-or-treaters at our house. So, and our, our I mean, my girls are only like a year and a half, so they won't really know what's happening, and <laughs> it's more for us. So they are actually dressing up as uh, little peeps, little chickens, and my wife was like, I'll be a, a scarecrow, you can be a farmer. She's like, just put jeans on and a flannel and like walk around I'm like... Then I just look at a, a dad with jeans and a flannel on. I just look like a dad. Like <laughs> it's actually a farmer. Oh, is that a dad? So we're still working on it. But I think that's the plan right now. We'll see. Honey, you could just be a farmer. How about that? Like <laughs> I was uh, like, I need something else besides just jeans and a flannel. I'll literally just be myself. You could do that. I will go first and my slate breaker, I'm going back to back weeks where I picked two players. Last week, super risky, totally paid off. This week easily could pay off it is devonta smith and terry mclaurin that correlation could be really really good terry mclaurin has averaged 14.3 half ppr points per game against philadelphia in his career in nine games like he's had a pretty good success history against them the ceiling games i don't think he's had a game where he's hit like 35 in dk points but you're getting 20 25 and i think he's a real threat for 100 yards devonta smith that's the one that people are scared of Washington secondary against opposing pass games, 29th in schedule adjusted fantasy points, 29th in yards per attempt, and his last three games against the Commanders, 8 for 166 and 1. He was the wide receiver one on the week, 6 for 39 and 1, and then this year he was 7 for 78. He has a pretty good little history against them, and I will take this little correlation and take it to the bank. I love it, man. I especially am in Ontario this week. I think the price point and everything is just, it's perfect. So I'm with you. Um, I also want to drop down and give some value slate breakers this week and potentially just play the whole stack. I'm not sure if I'll go there or not yet, but Carolina, man, we we always talk about them, right? We're like, well, they're terrible against the run and then we just move on, but they're quietly like super, super injured on defense. CJ Stroud comes out of the bye week. Robert Woods trending to miss this game. So you were going to get a super condensed target tree between Nico Collins, who's 5,500, and Tank Dell, who's 4,900 out of concussion protocol. Uh, Cornerback JC Horn, Jeremy Chin on IR. Shaq Thompson on IR. Your Turgo Matos on IR. All those guys and both starting safeties on the injury report this week. So you're getting backups against CJ Stroud, who has just been dominant this year. In the intermediate area of the field, mm, Carolina mm. cannot rush the passer 30th in pressure rate. I think Stroud goes off here, carves him up. And I just want to highlight how good Nico Collins has been. 3.01 yards per run is fourth in the NFL among all wide receivers with 25 plus targets. So he's been awesome. This is a great matchup. Both guys are cheap. I think you can play all three of those guys if you want to do the double stack, but I'll have exposure to both Collins and Tank Dell. Can you play either of those in cash? I don't think you need to. I think you could. I just don't think you necessarily need to because like, I, I prefer Christian Kirk for cash for a couple hundred more. Um, I prefer Zay Flowers for a hundred bucks more, but I still want to take shots yeah. at tournaments. Nope, that makes sense. I feel like it was the uh, the meme of the kombucha lady. Maybe, huh? You could, huh? Well, huh? <laughs> so yeah, I like that call and you use an intermediate area stat. 
on CJ Stroud, which you know, man, that's that's the stat for quarterbacks. That's where he slays. That's the that's where he goes. So uh, those are our slate breakers this week. What could go wrong? Prop it like it's hot. Last week in the DFS pass, we had a great week. Great week for props. If you're on board, hopefully you uh, played it the right way. We had a lot of people that parlayed them together. And let us say this again. We personally do not do that. Betts and I do not take these props and just say, hey, we're going to play five of them together. That worked out for a lot of people this past week. If you want to do that for these, be my guest. Um, It's just not how we look at props. And we don't think that's the best strategy long term. It's volatile, but it is super fun. Betts, I'll let you go first. All right, I got two here on the dock. I'm going to take Alexander Madison and we're going to go under on his rushing yards. Um, it's been pretty rough this year for Madison from a, a game to game standpoint, as far as his efficiency, you add that in. And then last week on Monday night football, we sort of saw a little bit of a changing of the guard. I'm not saying Cam Akers is going to take over as the lead back, but it's, I think trending to be closer to a 60, 40, 50, 50 sort of split. Actually, Cam Akers led this duo in carries, and he was in there when the game was close at the end when they needed to ice it away. So this line is pricing it in as if Alexander Madison is guaranteed to be the leader in the backfield. I'm not sure that's the case. So give me under 49 and a half on Alexander Madison. I will take Travis Etienne. Perhaps you've heard of him in fantasy. He's been crushing the last three weeks. His line right now, or it was 61 and a half rushing yards. Bets, I want you to look that up just to see, you know, if we've been moving the lines or not, but Travis Etienne is averaging 18 carries a game, 72 yards of ground, and Steelers are one of the worst in the league in terms of rush yards per game allowed. It's 142. They're 28th in EPA per rush attempt in six games this year. Seven different running backs have hit this mark, which is means that multiple running backs have done it, including Royce Freeman, who was just off the street last week. The only running backs that failed were the Ravens, And if this game is close, I expect the Jaguars to lean on the run. They have a 52% neutral rush rate. And I, uh, yeah, I like the over. Has it moved? I'm with you. Tell me. You can get, well, kind of. (laughs) You can still get this at (laughs) at 61 and a half currently on MGM. You can also get it on DraftKings, but it's now minus 130. However, it is at 63 and a half on FanDuel. So kind of. You kind of move the lines. So, 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 so I, I won't hit the drop. I, not, yeah, no. don't hit it. You don't deserve it. Um, I also want to give a bonus one. Can I give one more? Sure. Okay. Christian Kirk. We've talked about him a lot on the show. And I feel like sometimes, you know, we try to make prop betting harder than it needs to be. Christian Kirk just hits this line on a weekly basis. Since the Zay Jones injury, he is averaging over 77 yards per game. He's been over this mark in all games but one. I'm going over 52 and a half receiving yards on FanDuel. We already talked about the matchup. It's awesome. Pittsburgh gives up a ton of wide receiver yards, especially over the middle of the field. If you watched Puka Nakua last week, I think it's going to be the same thing this week for Christian Kirk. It's going to be over 52 and a half receiving yards. And you're saying this is a two unit banger? Oh, 10 actually. <laughs> oh, that's one of my favorite things when Bets and I are coming up with our prop bets and sending them out. It's just like, okay, is this, does this, is this the one where I empty the bank account? Is this the one where I go all in? This is the one right here. This is this is it. This is going to make or break our week. Christian Kirk. We did have one of those last week. The Allen Robinson one was the one that we felt super confident of like, take the under, go for it. So that one was nice that it hit. It's really bad when the, you know, spend the bank account ones don't hit. But anyway, glad you're with us. Uh, you can go to ballersdfs.com if you want to play in our DraftKings League, Fantasy Footballers, DFS, Borg, and Bets. We have a 600-person contest if you want to get in there and join us and take our money, and ex- us explain to our kids why we can't win against people, although we do this for a living. They don't understand it yet. Our kids are too young, but one day they will ask, Mommy, Daddy, why do we have no money? It's because your father <laughs> could not win a DFS against people that he was giving advice to. In fact, let me just say this as we end the episode. I had a friend. We were just having having a beer, enjoying our time together, and he's like, you know what, Kyle? I enjoy listening to your podcast. But sometimes you don't take your own advice. And then I hear you say, oh, this guy won $10,000 because he took your advice. Do you think that's like the worst part of our job is like we play when we don't win. It's painful and we're happy for other people. But then it's like, man, I didn't win and and you took my own advice. Yeah. You know what you need to do, Kyle? 
this weekend, you can just set a reminder on your phone to just re-listen to this show. Okay. Listen to, your, listen to yourself. Take a couple notes, and uh, and then you can win some money. How about that? I think next year in the DFS Pass, we will include a clause that's very, very small, that no one can see. And we have tons of lawyers that do work that says 55% of the winnings go to us. So <laughs> <laughs> that would be freaking awesome. But then also people would be like, if I lose, you're responsible. Oh, well. We'll figure that part out. Bets, tell the people bye. Yes, sir. Should be a very fun slate. Lots of ways to get different. And uh, I think a lot of good action this weekend. So enjoy the football. Best of luck to all of you out there. Hope you bring something big in this week. We will catch you on Tuesday for week nine. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at thefantasyfootballers.com.